All right. So first of all, if this is a surprise that I'm giving this talk, um, that's because uh, someone last minute dropped out, and um, I was uh, lucky enough to be allowed to step in. Um, so not the most uh, rehearsed talk in the world, so forgive me if uh, there are some hiccups. But um, I want to talk today about uh, from metrics to profiling and back. And if that means absolutely nothing to you, that's totally OK. Hopefully, we'll pick up everyone um, from zero, and we'll get there by the end. So before I get into anything, uh, basically, I want to start with a problem. Um, and we've probably seen CPU graphs or really any other kind of graph that looks something like this, where we have some sort of spike. And we're just asking ourselves, right, like this baseline is typically around one CPU core. Why the heck is it now? like? spiking so much, right? And probably, you know, there, there'll be some theories in the team. Someone will be like, oh, this is probably garbage collection, right? Like, someone's going to say, ah, oh, this is this uh, pathological query that this uh, one user um, in our organization always does. But, um, you know, theories are just theories. And what's better than theories? It's data. And um, profiling is a tool that has basically existed ever since software engineering has existed because we always needed to understand down to the line number where are our resources spent. And most of the time, we're going to be talking about CPU profiling, but theoretically, profiling can be done with any kinds of resources that are spent by our processes. Thank you very much. Um, so in this particular case, what I would want to see is a CPU profile from exactly that spike. And you know, in this particular case, I was the pathological user that was doing some very, very expensive query just so that I could produce uh, this data. And now I could actually dive into the data and figure out that, yes, this was, um, this was a query. Again, if this means nothing to you, that's totally cool. I just wanted to show you uh, kind of the problem statement. So who am I? Um, I'm Frederick. I founded a company called Polar Signals. If that sounds familiar, maybe that's because we organized this year's PromCon. Um, but you maybe also know me as a maintainer of the Prometheus project. More specifically, I maintain the Kubernetes integration in Prometheus. Um, through all of that work, I eventually also became a tech lead um, in the Kubernetes project for a couple of years. I passed that on uh, to the next generation. I'm a Thanos maintainer. I created um, the Prometheus operator, which I think we've heard a couple of times already. I created a project called Kube Prometheus, which I think also a lot of you are running. And finally, I created this uh, profiling project called Parka. So let's talk about profiling. Here is where we're going to start from zero. So how do sampling profilers actually work? Um, so typically, sampling profilers are the profilers that we run in production because they have low enough overhead that we can actually do it in production without affecting our users' um, user experience. And the way that these kinds of profilers work is that basically all they do is a certain number of times per second, we look at what is the current function call stack. Um, and we just record that, let's say, 100 times per second. Right? That means that if we see a stack, um, that means, roughly statistically speaking, we've spent 10 milliseconds in that stack. Obviously, like I said, that's only statistics. But the more often we observe the same stack, the more likely that statistics actually um, you know, is likely to, to, be, to, to be true and wasn't just by chance that we saw this stack once. And so the longer we do profiling, the better our uh, statistical significance gets. And in the like, olden world, let's say, uh, we, did, like, we looked at a process for a 10-second period of time, let's say. Uh, we recorded the stack traces. And that told us, for exactly those 10 seconds um, that we were observing our process for, where CPU time was being spent. And there's this new kind of phenomenon happening. Um, and you may have heard of a couple of uh, open source projects in this space that do continuous profiling. So as the name maybe already implies, we're not just looking at a process for a 10-second period of time. We're actually always looking at the process and kind of collecting this data um, over time. And I always like to say this is kind of the same evolution as we've gone from like Nagios checks or something to time series and doing alerting on time series rather than just checking, is this thing up, is this thing up, right? 
Profiling used to be we just do this check once, um, and continuous profiling is now that we're kind of systematically doing this over time so that just like with any other observability data, we're always going to want the data we don't have, and with continuous profiling, kind of naturally, we'll have the data. And so basically, like I said, with continuous profiling, all we do is really collecting all of this data um, over time. And there are lots of challenges with doing this, and I'm not here to, today to talk about any of that. Um, there are lots of talks on the internet if you're thinking, uh, if you're curious about that. Um, I'm here to talk about how does profiling actually connect with the world of metrics. That's why we're here, right? To talk about metrics and Prometheus. And long story short, it's through metadata. Um, and specifically in the Parker project, um, this is something that we did very, very intentionally, um, and I'm going to show a quick demo about this. Um, the whole idea is um, we can always find the right profiling data by just having consistent metadata attached to our profiling data, data as we do with metrics. And so this is going to look very familiar to people, uh, to everyone here, hopefully, who uses Prometheus, because in Parka, we kind of have the exact same, let me make this a bit bigger, um, the exact same kind of labeling system. That's not by chance. That's literally the same code as Prometheus. And so you can then say something like, you know, your Kubernetes uh, component label um, is, OK, cool, like Prometheus, for example, right? Um, and now we can see all of the CPU data in this Kubernetes cluster um, related to the Prometheus instances that we have here. So that way is actually pretty easy, but that's only because we've actually designed the system um, to be very easy to interact from, from metrics to um, profiling data. And the Prometheus project actually has a very long history um, with profiling because, as you all know, Prometheus you know, is pretty optimized for the workloads that it's um, meant for. And so um, when the Prometheus 2.0 uh, storage was he heavily being worked on, we created this thing called Prombench, which was, um, or still is, a tool that we can call, just like you're seeing Brian do, do here on this pull request, where we can just call a command on a pull request and say, okay, run benchmarking for this particular um, pull request and compare it against the main branch in this case. Um, and what it then does is it kind of spins up a synthetic, synthetic load and uh, kind of starts monitoring both of those Prometheus instances and gathers all sorts of observability data. We have a bunch of dashboards where, where we can then see, um, do we have any sorts of regress regressions? Is the memory usage um, better or is it worse? Typically, we definitely always run this um, when we are about to do a Prometheus release to ensure that there are no regressions so that we compare the latest uh, version that we've released with the one that we intend to release. And um, that's kind of for quality assurance, but um, what we often also use it for is to kind of prove or disprove theories, right? Um, we say, okay, in this particular um, example, actually, on this pull request, you know, someone had the idea, I think doing these changes is going to improve Prometheus memory usage uh, by you know, doing some sp specific strategy. Um, and having reproducible, reproducible tooling like this is super useful because it actually allows us to run these experiments very easily and prove or disprove theories very easily. Now, maybe you already see where this is going, but um, these metrics are really nice to like, see on a high level why this is happening. But when we're comparing releases, for example, where there are probably hundreds um, of commits in between, um, how can we kind of figure out what is actually the difference here, right? Like, if there's a memory reg regression or a CPU regression, where is actually that change? Where has that change happened? And um, I didn't actually de do these changes, but Bartek um, of the Prometheus team recently added uh, Parka to uh, the Prombench setup, and um, this has already kind of proven 
proven to be useful because now we can actually not just see these high-level metrics um, for the comparison, but we can actually dive deep down into the code to see exactly down to the line number where are these changes um, manifesting, right? Um, and that can be good, positive, or, you know, neutral. And um, as I was actually uh, preparing this talk, I um, was kind of talking about all of these theories, and uh, I say he's uh, laughing over here because um, he was saying that uh, when Bartek, in, uh, he was very excited about Bartek implementing this because um, this used to be a very, very uh, kind of manual task in the Prometheus project, and sometimes we spend days or weeks finding where these problems lie, specifically because of all the problems that I've already mentioned with kind of the traditional manual profiling world where we need to observe the process in exactly the right time at exactly um, the right moment to kind of catch whether when there's like a CPU spike, for example, right? And that's really, really difficult to get right, and that's why we need um, continuous profiling for the Prometheus project as well so that we can continue to you know, deliver the consistent performance that we do. Okay, so now we've kind of covered all of the world where we go from metrics to profiling data. How do we now go um, the other way, right? So how do we kind of extract metrics from profiling data? Um, and this is not coming out of kind of nowhere. This is actually a request we've had several times from our customers um, because they wanted to kind of monitor very specific um, aspects of their um, of their software. So they build some sort of, let's say, some database, right? And they have a specific process that must always be utilizing X amount of resources by the, um, by the process. And if not, then, you know, we need to have a look and figure out why this is happening. So they basically wanted to do alerting on profiling data. Um, and before we dive into kind of the depths of um, the data that we can produce, uh, you know, foreshadowing, this is possible now. Um, but before we kind of uh, dive into that, we need to cover a little bit of terminology in profiling. So we've seen the icicle graph earlier. Um, and essentially what that is, the x-axis is the amount of CPU time that was spent by a function. And the deeper, um, kind of going from the top to bottom, the deeper the stack is, the closer we get to the leaf. So, you know, no further functions being called. In this particular case, the main function is kind of the root, and it calls iterate. And once iterate finishes, it calls iterate long. And the reason why I'm going through all of this exercise is um, in profiling terms, the main function um, uses a cumulative CPU um, let's say this, these are seconds, right, a, a, a cumulative sum of 11 seconds because its children iterate take one second and iterate long takes 10 seconds, right? Um, but main itself is not actually doing any work, right? So its flat value, that's what this is called in profiling, is zero. It itself is not doing any work, but in cumulative, it and its children is doing 11 seconds worth of work. And then we kind of, as, the, as we go deeper down the stack, um, you know, iterate only uses, uh, uses cumulative one because it itself uses one. And then the same with um, iterate long, but, you know, it's doing more work. So now that we have this, we can actually produce some metrics out of this. And we created this thing that we call Profile Exporter, very um, you know, imaginative in terms of our naming here. But basically, the way this works is it um, has a configuration that we'll go over in a second, um, where you can configure um, it to query Parka in, um, you know, with particular queries. And then it generates these three metrics. So it generates the. Uh, one metric that gives you the cumulative of um, the root. So basically, how much did this entire process um, use if we're looking at pro uh, CPU profiling data, for example? And um, then of each query that we're, that we're issuing, it will generate a cumulative um, metric and a flat metric so that we can specifically figure out, you know, um, 
with the cumulative value, we'll be able to say something like, this entire subsystem is using X amount of uh, CPU resources of the entire process. And we can do that by using the other metrics for comparison. So before we get into that demo, um, this is uh, what the configuration looks like. And I alighted a, a couple of things because you know, authentication is important, but um, you know, it was taking up a lot, a lot of sc screen real estate. Um, but basically, you um, configure a remote write at point that, that it was sent this data to, because it already has to work with um, timestamps that come from Parka itself. And so it was either a metrics endpoint that exposes timestamps, um, which is basically um, almost the same as a remote write. And also, that is what our customer wanted. Um, but in theory, a met slash metrics endpoint uh, would be just as possible. Um, then you configure which um, Parka server you want to issue these um, requests to, and then you have a configuration where you can specify multiple queries. So you name the query, um, then you actually write the text of the query, and then you say, um, whenever you run the query, over which duration do you want um, all of the data to be merged over. So for example, you could say, I want every two minutes, I want the last two minutes of profiling data to be merged up um, so that I can then see you know, how, how this is behaving over time. And the matchers uh, basically say, um, any function that matches this substring um, will be producing a metric. So without further ado, let's have a look at the demo. So I have a, a super simple uh, Parka setup here where um, this is actually scraping a Prometheus server. And as we can see, um, actually most of the work is uh, collecting profiling data itself. But over here, we can see that uh, Prometheus is actually also doing a little bit of work. And primarily, it's scraping itself. So that's what we're seeing in terms of the CPU time. So all of that makes perfect sense, right? Um, but uh, what we, the configuration that I used for the profile exporter is over here. So um, what we can see here is um, I basically what I want to check is um, how much is garbage collection using in my um, Prometheus server. I'm looking at that every 20 seconds. Um, and you know, this is the, uh, let's say, call it the metric name in Parka, um, because Parka basically has a very Prometheus-like um, query language. Actually, it quite literally uses the Prometheus parser underneath. Um, so um, this is already running. So now what we can do is we can pull up our Prometheus server. And what we can see here um, is this metric, right? We can see, let me make this bigger, um, profile exporter cumulative value, and we can see the function name is exactly the one that we were filtering by, right? And so now um, we can actually see every 20 seconds how many CPU samples we're observing um, in the profiling data. So that's super cool, right? Like now we can say, okay, um, I want the TSDB path in Prometheus to only use this much of the CPU resources. Or this could theoretically be done uh, for memory as well, right? Like, I want to say, OK, my, the memory of this uh, particular process is not supposed to um, be using more than x amount of megabytes, right? Um, and so now we can actually observe this. But much, what's much, much more important typically is I want to be able to say, this is not using you know, a number of CPU samples. It's not super useful. Um, I want to be able to express it's not supposed to use more, more than 30% of uh, the CPU uh, that the entire process uses. So this is exactly what this other metric is for. So we can um, divide it by the profile root cumulative value. So now we can see, wow, actually, sometimes the only thing that this Prometheus server is doing is garbage collection, right? 
Um, now, this is a, an example Prometheus server, right? Like, it's scraping itself. Um, this is not like a dunk on Prometheus or anything like that. But the point is, we can actually now quantify this. And when we have a good idea about how our application is supposed to be behaving, we can now understand this pretty much down to the line number, right? And so we can be very exact about all the experiments that we're driving and evaluate whether they're actually working in the way that we intend them to do. So that is pretty much it. So what we've learned today is that we can go from metrics to profiling data with metadata, and we can go back again using a profile exporter. And that's it. Thank you so much. All right, do we have questions? Um, yeah, this looks very exciting. Uh, can we use the profile exporter for uh, anything else other than Parka, or is it Parka specific? So um, at the moment, it uses the Parka API to issue the queries, so it is um, specific to that. But theoretically, we could build anything that um, it, it's possible, but it, it would require some knowledge of the underlying um, like data source. But yeah, theoretically possible. Um, sorry, I forgot the question. I'm here. Uh, I'm just curious, like, uh, what's the consideration of like creating profile exporter instead of maybe having that as feature in Parka itself? Maybe you can have that as configurations because we probably don't want to have more exporter. But <laughs> yeah, uh, great, great question. Um, so it is something that we've, that we've considered. But um, honestly, this kind of grew out of um, customer interest initially. And maybe it's something that will eventually work back into the Parker pro project. But Parker really only cares about profiling today, right? And it would be opening this huge kind of worms that like, everybody's going to want to do you know, arbitrary PromQL queries on all of this data. Um, and while I think that's all super useful, it's just, you know, would very significantly increase the scope of the Parker project today. Maybe it's something we'll do in the future, though. I think it's certainly very interesting. It's me. Uh, <laughs> okay, now I remember. <laughs> uh, I'm interested in how how complex is the the setup. Like you are, you mentioned that you are helping a customer, and um, how fast could the, the 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 customer adopt that? Like I, I feel like. People with experience would have uh, an easy, easy understanding, but someone that, is not, that not, does not understand profile very well, does not understand metrics, how to connect everything, it sounds a little bit complicated. So um, I think the, the big leap is to start using continuous profiling. Once you, once you do that, this is very, very easy. As a matter of fact, this whole profile exporter is maybe 150 lines of code. Um, so yeah, you're right. It's it's really mostly about um, this this company already was already doing profiling, but they found a bunch of limitations uh, with regular profiling. Basically, everything that we talked about today. Um, but now they're like, okay, we actually understand our profiling data very very intimately, um, and we want to make sure that the quality of our software continues to you know stay as high quality as we as we want it to be. So. Granted, this is probably something, this particular use case is probably something that you know, more advanced organizations um, are going to employ. Um, yeah, sorry, uh, I have a question. Uh, so my understanding is that you cannot really um, get the metric for every function of your program, right? Because you will get a problem with the labels. Uh, and let's say you are, um, um, looking at a specific function and you get a cumulative time that is big but a flat that is small and you don't expect that, then uh, have you considered doing something like uh, reconfiguring on the fly the, the exporter so that you could like look in function deeper so that you get an understanding on that? Yeah, super, super good question. So uh, something, something else that we've actually done in the past is um, we've um, not 
made this like a remote write where we ingest the data into a Prometheus, but we actually offer a remote read endpoint um, where a Prometheus can you know, ask a Parka server, um, give me metrics about all of this, and Parka just kind of internally says, okay, I'm going to pretend all this profiling data is all metrics. That's like insanely high, high cardinality metrics, but I'm just going to serve you whatever you're requesting, right? Theoretically, that's where we want to end up, but it's a very hard problem to solve. So, you know, baby steps. But it's a really cool, cool idea. For example, with um, memory profiling data, you, you would all of a sudden see like the cumulative value of probably the subsystem that you know, has a memory leak. You would very obviously see it um, growing, right? And you, the like, troubleshooting time would very dramatically um, fall by doing that. So definitely something that we want to explore further. All right. I don't see any other questions. Right. Then thank you, Frederick. And thank we you. are back in four minutes or so for the next talk. <laughs>